It was 1983. Catholic high schools in Ontario had public funding, but only up to grade 10. Students in upper grades had to pay tuition, if they could. The Premier of the province said he was against extending the funding. This was in June or late May. I was out cutting the grass when uh, four or five students from Cardinal Leger, which was uh, you know, a five minute walk from our house, came to see me. And they posed a very simple question to me, they, and they were very polite. They said, Mr. Davis, we are finishing grade 10. Uh, we're told if we want to continue at Leger, we will have to have our parents pay a fee. If we go to Brampton Centennial, which is, you know, a uh, 15-minute walk the other direction, we don't have to pay anything. Uh, can you explain this to us? I hope, and I was gentle in my response, but it obviously was not one that uh, uh, answered their question. You know, it just, uh, shall we say, crystallized in my own thinking how it would be so difficult to explain to a lot of these young people, uh, not just at Leger, but the other Catholic high schools, uh, the logic of what was happening. The students' futures hung in the balance, much like the future of the Catholic high schools, which were struggling from a shortage of funding, but they had been there before. In the 1830s, there was no supposition across Upper Canada, which was then Ontario, that, that there was any responsibility from the government to support any kind of education. I mean, in the sort of what, what we would call the mostly private Catholic schools, uh, mostly young men were grooming themselves for the liberal professions, uh, sometimes the priesthood. Religious orders soon joined the effort and started teaching young women. In these early years, there was some financial aid for schoolmasters secured by the Bishop of Kingston, Alexander MacDonnell. Parents accepted any support they could receive and were eager to enroll their children. Their enthusiasm resulted in a series of laws. The School Act allowed Catholics to create their own schools. The Scott Act legislated trustees for Catholic schools. And the schools won some federal funding from the Common School Fund. Catholic schools were growing in Upper Canada. Meanwhile, the public schools sought to promote a generic Christianity. 1900, what we have in Ontario is a fairly well-defined dual school system. The majority in a publicly funded, non-denominational system. And even in the public schools, there had to be a kind of acceptable generic Christianity uh, that would fit all the denominations, including the Catholic. Led by Toronto's bishop, Armand de Charbonnel, Catholic parents suspected that this generic Christianity was effectively Protestantism. As you have to understand, in the 1850s, um, religious emotions were very close to the surface. And with increased tension between French-Canadian Catholics and English-Canadian Protestants at the heart of North America, you have this, how should we say, this cauldron uh, of excitement and agitation uh, that erupts rhetorically in newspapers, it erupts in the streets in terms of rioting, uh, uh, and of course the schools become the heart of it. Before Confederation, education was a federal responsibility, governed by the Canadian Assembly. So Catholics in Upper Canada could count on the support of French lawmakers from Lower Canada. Some Protestants resented being forced to accommodate Catholic schools. There is a sense that Catholics, by asserting themselves in terms of their own schools, uh, are actually uh, getting rights and privileges that they really shouldn't have. In 1867, Canada was formally established with the British North America Act. Federal and provincial governments were distinguished, and now the province was solely responsible for education. But that meant Ontario's Catholics were cut off from their allies in Quebec. The Archbishop of Toronto, Joseph Lynch, had a plan, formed with one of the Fathers of Confederation, Thomas Darcy McGee. 
The solution then was to consider the federal government having some powers over protecting the collective religious rights of those minorities. And so written into Section 93 of the British North America Act, a uh, section which still exists today in the Canadian Constitution, the federal government was essentially given the power to protect those minority rights. For Catholics in Ontario, this meant the right to establish, manage, and control their own schools. In time, Section 93 would become the touchstone for most constitutional and legal debates regarding Ontario's Catholic schools. Thanks to the BNA Act, Catholic elementary schools shared proportionally in the government's funds for education, but funding didn't extend to high schools. Catholics took note of the fact that they weren't allocated high schools. Why? Because, the Ontario government would argue, um, you have no right to them. Uh, under the provisions of the British North America Act, you have what exists in law. And in law, in 1867, there were no high schools. And so it goes that in the 20th century, you had this uh, interesting-looking Catholic high school, whereby grades 9 and 10 would be partially funded by the provincial government, and grades 11, 12, and 13 would be essentially private. Still, Catholics felt that their high schools were entitled to funding under the BNA Act. So in 1925, they brought a test case before the courts. It went all the way in the late 1920s to the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, the highest court of appeal in the British Empire, in, in London. The decision was bittersweet. The council decided that Catholics did have just claims to funding for grades 9 and 10, but the Catholic schools had no constitutional right to funding beyond that. It was a disappointing result at a critical time. The Catholic school population had doubled in the last 25 years. Facilities were old, classrooms were crowded, teachers were paid less than their public counterparts. Then the Great Depression hit, threatening the very existence of the system. As before, Catholic parents didn't waver in their commitment. The schools adapted. In the late 1950s and early 1960s, successful lobbying efforts resulted in new programs for funding from the Ministry of Education. 1960s really proved to be a, a time in Ontario history when education was really in the public eye. I think largely because it was an issue that mattered a lot to then Premier John Robarts and his Minister of Education, William Davis, who eventually became Premier uh, after Robarts uh, resigned. The government's foundation tax plan helped equalize funding for the poor have-not school boards. Not totally understood by the general public, probably not remembered by too many, but the foundation tax plan really made the first effort of creating equality in terms of property tax support. The school boards also became more efficient by amalgamating rural boards into larger county boards. The battle for equality emerged on another front. Ontario's Francophone families saw new opportunities in the 1960s, reflective of changes in Canadian society and developments in Quebec. Around the same time, the Ontario government created Francophone high schools. Many parents hoped this was a first step to one day having Francophone Catholic high schools too. Still, Catholic high schools continued to suffer because grades 9 and 10 alone received public funding, while senior grades mainly relied on tuition fees. And there were few signs this would change anytime soon. In 1971, the progressive conservative government of William Davis won a healthy majority. In his campaign, he said he would refuse to extend funding to those upper grades of Catholic high schools. Almost coincidental with Mr. Robart saying he was retiring, the government received the Bishop's Brief, as it was called, and this was a brief from the Bishops of Ontario related to the extension of the separate school system. And it was uh, obviously a contentious uh, issue. It was a political issue for me. 
My decision at the time was not because I was unsympathetic to the views of the bishops, but I didn't think it was realistically a time to move ahead with it. His polls back him up and Davis sweeps to a huge majority in the House. It had almost appears for a time in the early 70s that the issue of a funding completion is dead. The situation worsened after the election. The Davis government proposed making Catholic high schools subject to property tax. The plan could have proved fatal for the already struggling schools. Davis launched the Blair Commission to gauge public opinion. Across the province, it was met with passionate opposition by clergy, teachers, parents, and students. The tax plan was scrapped and Catholic high schools dodged a bullet. A decade later, Bill Davis was still premier and he had his chance encounter with students in front of his home. They weren't the only ones influencing his opinion. So too was a friend of Bill Davis, the Archbishop of Toronto, Cardinal Gerald Emmett Carter. Well, it was, uh, it was a very genuine friendship. I mean, there's some who felt that Cardinal Carter was after me all the time, making my life difficult, etc. Never the case. In all this business that Cardinal Carter put a lot of pressure on, that he blackmailed this and all the rest of it, it's just plain utter nonsense. He understood my problems. I understood his uh, very genuine desire to have the system extended. And uh, I understood uh, that before the next election, we would have to either confirm the existing position or we were to make that change. On June 12th, 1984, Davis announced that his government would extend the funding. The Davis decision in, in 1984 was a real head-scratcher for a lot of people. Wasn't this the same Bill Davis who in 1971 said no to funding completion to 11, 12, and 13 in the Catholic system? For those who say that this was a surprise, I read in the Roll Up News this morning, I shocked the legislature. I never shocked the legislature in all my times in the House. I may have surprised them, but I have never shocked them. I never saw any expression of shock over there. I just wish on occasion some of you had been shocked. Bill Davis had heard the voice of the students, and so did the Supreme Court. The constitutionality of full funding for separate schools and its requirement as part of the Confederation Pact thus established by a unanimous decision of our highest court. It appears from their reasons for judgment that a unanimous Supreme Court of Canada has reaffirmed this historic bargain. Ontario's Catholic schools finally enjoyed funding from junior kindergarten to the end of grade 13. Funds poured into the Catholic system and Ontario's landscape bore the imprint of new schools, complete with new facilities, equipment, and comforts scarcely imagined by previous generations. And the students came. Enrollment soon boomed to the 600,000 students today. What was decided was supported by certainly all of the political parties. I don't have any misgivings, nor do I second guess the decision, because I think it was right. Franco-Ontarian Catholics would soon see their hopes fulfilled too. In 1988, the first French language school board was created in Ottawa, Carleton. This led, 10 years later, to the establishment of French Catholic school boards. After a decades-long struggle, Catholic education in French now also extended from kindergarten right through grade 13. Funding equity has been realized, but we can't stop building upon that legacy. There are new challenges. An increasingly secularized society seeks to privatize religion. If Catholic schools lose their denominational character, they risk becoming irrelevant. I think one of the most important agents of making sure that, that the system does exactly what it's supposed to in terms of, of being a holistic system is the Institute for Catholic Education. Together with its partners and the Catholic Bishops of Ontario, they ensure that the curriculum is infused with Catholic thought and narratives. These efforts have placed a distinctively Catholic and Canadian stamp on the course texts. 
The Guidelines for Partnerships in Catholic Education helps educators make gospel-centered and socially responsible decisions. But is there room for these values in today's culture dominated by the bottom line? Despite a record of academic achievement and character formation, will Ontario taxpayers continue to support more than one publicly funded system? Seven provinces and one territory provide funding for faith-based schools in full or in part. But in Quebec and Newfoundland, parents lost their denominational schools. The greatest enemy of Catholic education in Ontario is apathy. Uh, those Catholics who have this gift have a privilege that few others in the Western world have. The enemy is us if we allow this gift to be buried in the ground. Educators, parents and students have much to celebrate. No less than the generations before them, today's kids need schools that place gospel values at the center of a holistic education. The gift is now in our hands. My hope is that there isn't really a need to safeguard. I would say to them that they should treasure it and they should work not to preserve it because that's not the right term to use, but I think to appreciate it, respect it, and continue to be involved to make it work. For all Catholics in Ontario, this is our story. We must witness to how Catholic schools contribute to the vitality of Ontario. When I hear the expression responsible citizen, I always relate it back to my Catholic education. And the reason why I do that is because Catholic education, it's about social stewardship, it's about solidarity with the people around you and to your global neighbors. Definitely as a Catholic and in a Catholic school system, I've been taught that learning is privilege. In a Catholic setting, we are taught that respecting other people is beyond important. And that's also part of Jesus' teachings, that everybody should be included, that everybody is made in the image of God. I think Catholic service is such a, a vital component of what it means to be a Catholic leader and a Catholic graduate. And the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others. Being a student in a Catholic school means practicing your faith in the community, absolutely. That aspect of religion and that sense of belonging in the school is what makes us different. I wouldn't trade that for the world. <laughs>